This is my third year taking Latin, and there's a question I've been asked all the time, and it is, why would you learn a dead language? And honestly, it's a good question because I don't really have a good answer to it. I guess it can help me build my English vocabulary or help me learn other languages. But oftentimes, these practical reasons are not enough to impress um, the person who asked the question. Well, I, I do many things in life that um, doesn't have a practical reason per se. And one of them is playing GeoGuessr, <laughs> which is a game in which you're dropped in a random place in the world and uh, the objective is to figure out um, where you are in the world. And if you get really good and you practice a lot, you might be able to tell Latvia apart from Estonia in a couple of glances. Um, learning Latin seems just as cool, but maybe just as devoid of practical usage. And that may well be because there are no native speakers left, left on this earth today. But let me ask this question. Do we learn languages in high school to be able to speak to the native speakers? I don't think that's the only reason. Because I would say out of all the high school students learning language in this country, only a small fraction of them will use that language skill in a practical degree. And I've been perplexed for a long time because I myself couldn't figure out why I love learning these languages so much, why I love learning languages, especially those that um, doesn't have as many speakers as, let's say, Spanish or Mandarin. But over the years, um, I've been able to come up with a couple of reasons, and today I'll share with you uh, three of them. The first reason is that there's so much culture and history embedded in the fabric of the languages. And let's say, for example, we can take the word hello, um, which is one of the most basic words we can find. And um, we could take this word for granted, but we could also um, look it up on Google. Um, what's the etymology of hello? And we would find something interesting. Actually, um, the word hello is an alteration of the form hola, hello, or holo, uh, which were all used uh, to get someone's attention, like how we say hey, as to get someone's attention and also say hi. Actually, th these words were not popular until the invention of the telephone. And it is said that Alexander Graham Bell suggested the use of ahoy as the telephone salutation, while um, Thomas Edison advocated for the use of hello, and the latter stuck with us till today. Um, ever wondered why the Spanish word hola and hello looked similar? And that may be because both of those words came from a French word, uh, which is also pronounced hola. Um, and that ultimately came from a Latin word phrase, hola, which means hey there. Um, but let's look at the Italian word for hello now. Um, it's, it's called we say ciao as for a casual salutation in Italy. And, but oftentimes in many languages, um, the word for hello has an obvious meaning or it can be found in many other languages related to it. Like um, hello, hello, hey, or marhaba, merhaba, etc. But for this Italian word, I couldn't really figure out what it might mean or where it may have come from. So I looked it up on the internet and I found a video by Luc Ranieri. Um, which is very interesting, and I'll share it with you today. Um, the word ciao um, comes from another Italian word, which is schiavo, and it means slave. And why did the word for slave become the word for uh, greetings? Um, that's because so in some countries, like Austria, people say servus as a form of salutation. And this is because this comes from a medieval phrase, Servus humilimus domine spectabilis, which means your most humble servant, my noble lord. And so when we say servus in many European countries as a form of hello, we, it is, we're repeating a medieval tradition that um, has been continued for centuries. Um, the word schiavo comes from a Byzantine Greek word, sklavos. Um, and the L before the A changed into I when it went to it, 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 Italian, like many other words in Italy, um, such as fiora, which came from flora. 
And actually, this is the reason why um, the city Florence is called Firenze in I Italy. And, um, the Latin word Florentia became Fiorenze, and it turned into the modern form. And the uh, Byzantine Greek word sklavos came from sklavos, which, also, which sounds the same, but means the Slavic people. And that's because most of the slaves in the Byzantine Empire came from the Balkans. And this is also the reason why um, in English, the word slave and Slav sound similar because they came um, from the same origin. And this Byzantine Greek word came from a Proto-Slavic word, and I'm not going to dare to pronounce that, but it means word, probably, in, in the Proto-Slavic. So um, just by looking into the etymology of a simple word like hello, we learned a whole lot about the... Um, um, history between the Byzantine Empire and the Balkans, and also some um, information about the history of slavery and a cool medieval Latin phrase. And I figured that um, these stories might be the reason why I love learning languages so much. Um, and just like how I loved listening to my mom telling me stories from all around the world in bedtime um, every night. Over the years learning Latin and Greek, I found that um, the words we regard to be fancy or erudite often have a very plain and simple origin. And an example would be the word perspective, which just means through seeing in Latin, or the word phenomenon in Greek just means thing having been shown, or the chemistry term, term homeostasis, or it's a biology term. Uh, it just means similarly standing in Greek. The second reason why I love learning languages so much is that different languages, each languages have a, some sort of feeling associated with it, that um, phrasing a, something in Latin or Fred, French feels, gives off a different feeling than if it was uttered in English or Japanese. And that is because many factors influence the way we perceive languages, um, but the most important is um, what we think about the native speakers of those languages. And so maybe we might find French to sound artistic or romantic. And we might also associate certain dialects, slangs, or accents with a minority, um, carrying with it the stereotypes and stigma. Social linguistics is a branch of linguistics that um, discusses the relationship between languages and how it is intertwined with the society. And these are some of the fact factors that influences linguistic features like sound, grammar, and vocabulary. And in social linguistic terms, um, Latin has something called linguistic prestige, which means that it is deemed more proper, correct, or superior to other languages. And that's because according to a linguist, Laurie Bauer, um, the beauty of a language is really just the reflection of the prestige of its speaker. And so Latin may sound authoritative or even beautiful because we admire those ancient Roman people. Um, Latin was just an everyday language in Rome and um, Roman people actually admired the Greek language as being a language of the scholars. But now that we admire the artistic and academic achievements of the Roman people, and, and also since the Latin Vulgate Bible had, is one of the most um, prestigious version of the Bible on earth today, it gains some sort of prestige. Uh, the Latin language gains prestige. That sense of linguistic prestige was solidified by the fact that for two millennia, the upper class, the scholars, the, the priests studied Latin um, while the lower class continued to speak the vulgar languages, um, which diverge more and more from Latin. And that's why scholars like Newton deemed it appropriate to write their books in Latin, even till recently, um, instead of writing it in their native language like English or German. Um, English is actually a very interesting language to study because it has such a dynamic history. And one example we can look at is uh, the origin of the word cow. 
After the Norman invasion, the upper class of the English society was dominated by the French-speaking people, while the lower class still continued to speak Anglo-Saxon. And so the, cow, the word for cow, um, which is an animal that probably interacted more with the peasants, um, came from the Anglo-Saxon word coo, while the meat which was eaten by the nobility came from a French word boeuf. And here's another example of it. And actually, after that, the words that has an Anglo-Saxon origin gains a um, casual or even vulgar and impolite connotation. And a fun example would be um, this. The Latin word excerno, which means to sift out, um, is the origin of the word excrement in, in English, which, you know, is, can still be spoken in the most formal settings, like a university lecture. In contrast, the word that comes from the Anglo-Saxon equivalent to this word, um, which is this, um, is, cannot really be spoken in a public setting like this. And on a serious note, uh, slangs like this is um, actually quite important because um, slangs, dialects, and accents play a key role in building community and the sense of inclusion. And a fun fact is that the Proto-Indo-European root of that word, ske, is actually the origin of the word science. So the S word and science actually came from the same place. And, and the social linguistic dynamics didn't end um, in the good old days. It continues to this day. And the racial dynamics here in America is represented today by the fact that the standard American English is deemed to be proper and polite, while the African American vernacular English is deemed by many people to be not appropriate for certain settings. And this is an act actually a very fascinating topic, so if you're interested, I highly recommend uh, looking into it. I love learning languages because it tells so much about our society, that it tells so much about how we keep our social structure and how we build the sense of community and inclusion. And also, if you think about it, this is the first reason that comes to our mind if we think about learning languages. Uh, we learn Spanish to be able to be included in the community of Spanish speakers. And we, when we meet a friend from another country, we first try to learn their slangs because that's how we feel included. But I hope you can see that the number of native speakers have nothing, nothing to do with the value of this community building. And I myself often find that learning something about more minor, minor languages um, can be more rewarding. It can feel like opening a hidden treasure box and it gives a sense of inclusion and new possibilities. Moving on to the third reason why I like learning languages, and that is that it's simply so diverse. And the first example I'll give is how in English classes, we've been told repeatedly that active verbs are good and passive verbs are bad. And that is arguably true in subject prominent languages like English, in which the sentence is composed of the subject and, um, and the things that the subject does or is attributed with. So in, in languages like English, there are two ways of building, constructing a sentence. And the first is with an active verb, and the second is with the passive verb. However, in languages like Korean, Japanese, or Hungarian, and many other languages, um, this is not the case. They are topic prominent languages, which means that the sentence is composed of the topic and a comment that comments on the topic. And so in those languages, sentences are divided into three categories or more, depending on the complexity of the sentence. So um, I highlighted the topic of each sentence, which is the focus um, of that sentence. And in these languages, as you can see, um, the subject doesn't have that sacrosanct position in the sentence as it does in the subject prominent languages. So we can simply delete the, sub, uh, delete the 
uh, subject in the first sentence and it still makes sense. Um, the first sentence here in the example just means that homework was eaten and um, that is completely grammatically correct. Um, and this is a whole different way of, of grammar, a whole different way of perceiving the language. And I, I find this fascinating because languages influence our way of thinking. And that if two la different languages have a very different system of grammar, it is likely that those two um, countries or groups of people have a very different way of thinking and perceiving the world. And therefore, um, a study shows that bilingual speakers are more likely to catch subtle differences or nuances in meaning. Um, let's look at some other examples. And the first one is um, the subjunctive mood. And English doesn't really have a subjunctive mood, but if you've learned languages like Spanish, French, or Latin in, um, cl in school, you would have learned about it. And here's an example. Um, subjunctive mood differs from the indicative mood, which is like the normal um, version of the verb, in that it doesn't convey the fact. And it, it simply conveys the possibilities or suggestion. And so in English, to convey those meanings, uh, we usually use extra words like may, shall, or um, must. And the thing is, um, most, many languages don't just simply end there, and they have an elaborate system of del communicating the factualness of the information. And they do it through a system called the evidentiality. And here's an example um, in a language called Andoki. Um, they use suffixes to convey the, where the evidence of the information came from. So these two sentences have the exact same meaning. They both mean that the pie um, has made a canoe. However, because they have different suffixes, the first sentence conveys the idea that it, the information came from a third-hand source through rumors or hearsay. But what, whereas the second sentence conveys the idea that the speaker inferred that information from a general, general fact or some inf other information. And some other languages go even further to differentiate between uh, whether the inference came from a general fact or a information specific to that situation. And I, I find this really fascinating and intriguing because it sort of shows that human beings innately have a scientific spirit that we have, we care about where the information came from, although maybe not in the degree of the speakers of Endoki. Here's um, another feature of Endoki, and it's that the prefix ba, uh, which is a assertive prefix, shows that the speaker is sure about the language. And um, so in both cases, although the information came from different sources, um, the speaker is sure and certain about that information. And here's another language, uh, Wintu, which is a Native American language. Um, it has a cool feature of showing whether the information came from a visual source or a non-visual source. In this case, the suffix shows that the information came from a non-visual source. So, um, in English, we might translate it as, I heard him chopping the wood, or he chopped the wood, and I somehow felt it through non-visual senses. Um, and there's also, I talked about the active and passive voice, but there are more voices than just active and passive, and one of that is the middle voice, and which is found in ancient Greek and Hebrew and some other languages. But there's also the anti-passive voice, which is uh, a very um, interesting topic, a very a topic that would blow your mind if you're interested in linguistics. Um, the, to talk about anti-passive voice, we should first talk about ergativity. And um, in languages like English, which has a nominative accusative alignment, um, the two bobs in two of these sentences have serves the same function in the sentence. They're both subjects of the sentences. Whereas the, um, his cookies is an object of that sentence. And so 
um, we can combine these sentences into a compound sentence like this, Bob stands and cooks, cooks his cookies, and it makes total, totally correct grammatical sense. However, in, in these languages, if two, the two subjects are different, we can't really combine it. And the way we go around it is by changing the subject by using the passive voice and then combine it into Bob stands and is greeted by Daisy. However, ergative languages have the ergative absolutive al alignment, which means that um, these two Bobs um, are seen as ha serving the same purpose, which is, um, in other words, they're both in the absolutive case, whereas the subject of the second sentence, Daisy, is in the ergative sentence. So in those languages, we can simply combine these sentences into this sentence, Bob stands and Daisy greets. And to speakers of that, those languages, this means Bob stands and Daisy greets Bob. Um, but for these languages, um, these two sentences that um, could be combined in English um, cannot be combi combined so easily. So to get around that, they need to use the anti-passive voice, which sort of depassifies the already passive, almost passive information. And then um, this might be very confusing at first, this information, um, and that's precisely because this is a whole new way of creating information, of looking at the world. And I think this is the reason why languages are so important, that we should um, save all kinds of languages and care about all kinds of languages, even if they have very few native speakers. Um, each of the 6,500 languages in this world suggests a new way of looking at the, of um, understanding the world around us. And um, so today I talked about three reasons why I love learning languages. And the first is um, how there's so much culture and history embedded in the languages. And the second is that um, languages play a key role in constructing our society and building the sense of community and inclusion. And the third is that they're so diverse and they, each language suggests a different way of looking at the world. And what I realized after listing these three reasons is that they're all about um, human things, that they're, they're about the, our story, the way we build communities and the way we create meanings and communicate with each other. And so the Massachusetts Board of Education um, says that um, learning a foreign language can confer upon multiple educational benefits, and the first is um, expanding our perspective, and they also list that languages, learning languages permanently enrich and enlarge our appreciation of and understanding of ourselves and of others. And I think this is a beautiful description of language learning because language is so intimately connected with our, the way we think and live our lives and learning languages can therefore enrich our lives in a profound way. And I was thinking that this is not only true for language learning, but also to generally to anything that we find passion in, that things that we enjoy. For example, my little cousin um, loves Star Wars and he knows every single detail from the Star Wars movie. Um, by the way, this is not my cousin, I found this uh, photo in the internet. <laughs> um, um, but, I, but there are also people who um, love watches and knows everything about watches or, or about cars and knows all the specs of different cars. And I think we all love these kind of things because of the humanness of, the, of those things we like because they give us a sense of vitality through those details that we, we usually don't see in our everyday life. And really, um, I think this is the reason why we should have, why we should cherish our hobbies and passions because in our everyday busy and corrugated world, we often misses upon these details and humanness that we, um, that is so important in feeling conscious and present in the moment. To, to go back to the first question, which is that why would I learn a dead language? And this is my answer. Um, the language might be dead, but 
um, the stories that it conveys and, and the stories that we can find in the language is very much alive today with us. Thank you. Thank you.